a young mom saw her uh, young little boy out in the backyard and he was playing and he had a bat and a ball in his hand and his baseball cap and, and uh, he, was, he was talking to the trees in the bushes pretending that he was uh, in a big league ballpark and he was a professional baseball player. And uh, the little boy in his mind and, and, he, and he, he looked out and he yelled out, I'm the greatest hitter in the world! And he took his ball, threw it up, took a big swing. Strike one, the little boy said. Not, not discouraged at all. Again, he raised up his arms. I am the greatest hitter in the world. Threw that ball up, took a look, big swing, missed. Strike two, the little boy said. Now, undaunted again, he looked at the crowd as if he was and <laughs> spit his hands, wiped him there, adjusted his cap, took the bat, and he said, I am the greatest hitter in the world. Threw that ball up, had his eye right on it, took the biggest swing of his life. Missed it. Strike three, the little boy said. Then his eyes opened wide. I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. <laughs> you, you talk about turning a failure into a victory, right? Right? Well, uh, this morning we're talking about the art of failing forward, and if there's anybody that was familiar with failure, it was Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he began failing in business. Then he, he ran for the legislator. He was defeated. Then he was elected to the state legislator, um, but at that time then his, his fiance died, and he had a nervous breakdown. He ran for speaker and was defeated. He ran for elector and was defeated. He ran for Congress and was elected. Then he ran for Congress again and was defeated. He ran for Senate. Guess what? He was defeated. He was put on the presidential ticket. He ran for vice president and lost. Then he ran for Senate and he lost. But in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected the 16th president of the United States. You talk about a guy who uh, learned how to fail forward and wouldn't let failure defeat him. A guy like Lincoln never gave up. Well, listen, you and I, we make mistakes. We fail. We, we sin. Uh, maybe some of us have failed in school or in business. Maybe uh, we have failed our loved ones with broken promises. Maybe we have failed in the, in the area of drug or alcohol addiction or another, and, and we've just made our life a mess or, or the lives of others. Maybe we've experienced a failed marriage. Maybe we've broken the law and gone to prison, or perhaps we've failed spiritually uh, in, in some way. Listen, Failure is common to all of us, but it doesn't have to be fatal. Amen, church? Uh, here's one thing I want us to remember, and this is where we're going to start if you're following along in your message notes, which I hope you are, either uh, on the paper or, or on the church app. Failing doesn't make someone a failure. Amen? Failing doesn't make us failures. Okay, We don't have to be defined by our failures in life because... Uh, we have that sin nature, and we are going to stumble and fall and make mistakes and sin. Jesus noted this when he said in Mark uh, chapter 2, verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well uh, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. As I look around, I see a house full of sinners. Sorry. Amen. Sorry. Sorry. Where? <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to church today? Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> Calvary's not for perfect people, okay? This is not a country club. This is more of a hospital, okay, for the sick, for all us, all our, our sicknesses, our, our flaws, our mistakes, our failures, and and our sins. But Jesus, here's the good news, Jesus offers his mercy to us. When we confess and repent, we receive his mercy, his grace, his love, and his forgiveness. And that is the good news. 
But the choice comes down to us. Are we going to allow our failures to defeat us? Or are we going to be able to work through them and, and learn from them? Now, this morning, we're going to continue our series in exploring the life of Jesus. You know, a lot of times we have Easter, we talk about the resurrection, and that's it. We move on to another topic. I thought, no, we're going to hang in there for a little bit. Uh, we're going to hang in there for another three or four weeks and look at some different events that happened in the life of Jesus in his resurrected state before he eventually ascended and went to be with the Father in heaven. And this morning, we're going to look at a certain disciple of Jesus's who utterly failed. Utterly failed. And yet Jesus didn't let him live in that failure. Because Jesus had a purpose and a plan for his life. And I think there's a lot of encouragement and a lot of things you and I can learn from this disciple's example. So before we go on, though, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, I think failure, sin, making mistakes, messing up, blowing it, these are things that uh, it's human nature. We, we can all relate to that. Uh, and yet, Father, how do, we, how do we fail forward? How do we learn from our mistakes and, uh, and grow in our character, grow in our relationship with you, grow in our faith? That's what we want to look at today. And your word gives us plenty of, of sound teaching in that area. So I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to your word today, that your Holy Spirit might uh, move us to continue to grow into the people, the men and women that you've created us to be. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, we're going to talk about how to fail forward this morning. And the first thing we need to do is this. We need to check our egos at the door. You ever heard that? Check your ego at the door, man. All right? And that's the first thing that, that we all need to realize. I don't care who you are. Any of us, just because we're human beings, we have the potential to fail and to mess up and, and to stumble and to sin. Um, and I've found that failure often happens when we get overconfident, uh, lazy, or prideful. Had a guy named Dave who was in the first church that I ever pastored, and uh, Dave was a good guy, had three kids. Um, he uh, had a, a, a very successful job, made, made good money. Um, he uh, was also a spiritual guy. He would always open his home for church events. Uh, he led uh, an adult small group at his house. He was an usher, all that stuff, right? Um, well, Dave would often travel. And, uh, and I remember it was about 3 in the morning, and I got a phone call. Now, who is calling me at 3 a.m.? By the way, church, don't do that. All right, anyway, but <laughs> this guy, <laughs> it can wait, okay? It can wait. This guy calls me. Dave calls me at 3 a.m., and he's hysterical. On the other, pastor, 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 you got to help me, you got to help me. And he's crying. I said, what happened, Dave? He said, man, I can't believe what happened. He says, I was on a business trip, and we went to Japan. And the company that we were doing business with offered us a night with a prostitute. And I took one. And I came back, uh, and my wife asked me, how was your trip? And he said, I just broke down, and I told her, and, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Here's a guy that, <laughs> that felt he was strong, that felt he could resist temptation. And yet, when it came to face him, he fell. Now, this is no surprise uh, to Scripture. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Now let's talk about Peter. Uh, Peter was definitely Jesus's probably most outspoken 
uh, disciple, probably the most dynamic uh, disciple, but Peter had a weakness, and Peter's weakness was pride. Um, Jesus was at the Last Supper with his disciples, with the 12, and he was trying to prepare them for the events that were going to happen within hours. He was trying to tell them, listen, I'm going to be, I'm going to be arrested, and I'm going to be falsely accused. There's going to be mock trials, and, and then I'm going to be taken and, and crucified. They're going to kill me, but on the third day, I'm going uh, to rise. Um, and, and he shared this in Mark uh, chapter 14, verses 27 to 31. Let me read to you the story. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. He's talking to the 12. You're all going to fall away, for it is written. And then Jesus quotes Zechariah 13, 7 as fulfilling prophecy. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd... And the sheep will be scattered. Jesus is the good shepherd. His sheep were the twelve. When he got struck by the evil of Satan using the chief priests and the Romans, his disciples would flee. Verse 28. <clears throat> but after I am raised up, the resurrection, I will go before you to Galilee. So Jesus lays out the plan. He doesn't want his disciples to be unaware of what's going to happen. He's trying to prepare them. And look who speaks up. Verse 29, but Peter said to Jesus, even though they all fall away. And he's probably pointing to the other 11 disciples. Jesus, Lord, even though all these guys fall away, I will not. Peter Check your ego at the door, bro. All right? Verse 30, Jesus said to Peter, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me, Peter, three times. Three times. <laughs> Look how Peter responded. If I must die with you, I will not deny you. Peter said. Lack of self-awareness. Jesus knew Peter better than Peter knew himself. And the, all the rest of the disciples said, yeah, us too. Okay? Us too. Wow. <laughs> Listen, let me put this question on the screen. Do you want to avoid spiritual failure? First thing you got to do, check your ego at the door. All right? Be looking for it. Be, be aware of it. We need to remain humble. We need to know our weaknesses. Do you know your weaknesses? Do you know your temptations? We need to commit to daily prayer, daily time in God's word. This is where we are fed, church. We talk to God through prayer. We listen to him through reading his word. And we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit within us. To be the men and women God has created us to be. Because scripture recognizes how easy it can be to fall spiritually. We know of all the spiritual leaders, for example, in our country. You hear of a different one about every week who was tempted and, and, and fell. And so the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Therefore let anyone who thinks he stands, anyone who thinks he's got it all together spiritually, anybody thinks that he's Teflon and temptation will just roll off, take heed lest you fall. Peter fell. It was, at, it was right after the Lord's Supper. Right after Jesus had been betrayed by Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they were walking Jesus around to the house of the chief priests and others as they were making their case against him. And Peter, Peter followed behind. He was scared to death, but he couldn't leave Jesus. And so it tells us in Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 54, 
Then they seized Jesus, the Romans, and they led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. They didn't know he was there. He didn't have the courage to be right there with Jesus. He, he stood back. And when they, Peter and some others, had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard at the chief priest's house, and they sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing Peter as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. Peter was identified as a follower of Jesus. Verse 57, but Peter denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. One. Verse 58, and a little later, someone else saw Peter and said, you also are one of them, aren't you? But Peter said, man, I am not. Two. Denial. Verse 59, and after an interval of about an hour, still another person insisted, saying, certainly this man was also with Jesus, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Three denials. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Such a dramatic scene. Peter had spent three years with Jesus. 24-7. They, they ate together. They traveled together. Peter learned from Jesus' teaching. He served alongside Jesus, he witnessed the power of God working through Jesus. Peter saw the miraculous healings and, and, and miracles uh, and, and exercising of the demons. He saw the power of God working through Jesus. And yet, when his Lord was being betrayed and accused falsely, Peter Peter, the, the one who said, Lord, even if all of them deny you, I will never deny you. I will even die with you. Denied him three times, just as Jesus said he would. And as the rooster crowed, I guess they were in the plaza at the same time, and Jesus looked over at Peter. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Wow. We got to learn to check our egos at the door. <laughs> Learning to do that will help us not repeat the same mistakes that Peter did. Second way to fail forward is to admit when we're wrong. We need to learn to admit when we're wrong. Now, that's not easy for a lot of people. I've, I've met a lot of people in my life who, man, they'll mess up and they just won't admit that they're wrong, right? And one of them is my own daughter, okay? <laughs> not the one that comes here, not her, <laughs> okay? Give her a break. Another one, okay? The one, every gray hair I have has her initials on it, okay? This is one of my daughters. And, man, she would do all kinds of things, and she'd always lie about it, okay? And just kind of how she rolled. And I remember um, one weekend, my wife and I and some of the other kids, had, we had to be away. And my daughter was going to be at home. She was about maybe 16 or 17. And we said, now listen. No funny business while we're gone, okay? No messing around, and by that I mean no partying, okay? She had had a little uh, reputation. No parties, you got it? No parties, okay? I'd, I'd been down that road with her before. And uh, why I left her alone at the house, I have no idea to this day. <laughs> but, but we left, 
And, and we come home, and, and I'm walking in the kitchen, and it's sticky. <laughs> the kitchen floor is sticky. It's never sticky. And I thought, that's weird. I go out to the trash can. I'm, I'm emptying some trash. There's a trash can full of beer bottles. I'm like, she had a party. She had a party while I was gone. So I came in and I said, young lady, the, the floor is sticky and there's beer bottles in the trash can. You had a party, didn't you? And she looked at me. She was a professional. <laughs> she was a professional. She was just like straight faced. I don't know what you're talking about, father. <laughs> I said, listen. How, I, I don't drink. How did all those beer bottles get in our trash can? Oh, that, she said shalant, nonchalantly. She said, well, the neighbor boys next door, they had a bunch of friends over, and they were drinking, and, and they filled up all their trash cans, so they asked if they could use one of ours. <laughs> Does my T-shirt say dumb on it? And what about the floor? How'd the floor get all sticky? I don't know. Maybe I spilled some 7-Up. I don't know. I go, you're lying to me, young lady. She just looked at me. No. No, I'm not. I said, yes. Yes, you are. She said, no. No, I'm not. I said, you're grounded for three weeks. Bam. Okay? That girl would not admit when she had messed up or lied, or things like that, all right? Listen, if, 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 and it, it goes on into adulthood. If we don't learn to admit our failures and, and our sin, we're never going to move forward uh, in, our, in our walks with the Lord. The book of Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 13, says this, Whoever conceals his transgressions or his sins will not prosper. You want to hide that stuff? You don't want to come clean with God and with others? You're not going to prosper, the Bible says. But he or she who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. And that's true. Man, when we admit our mistakes, our sin, when we confess it, when we repent of it to the Lord, God, God forgives us, right? Now, back to Peter. Peter failed miserably, right? First he was prideful. Oh, Lord, I'll never deny you. I'm with you all the way. I'll die with you if they take you. Uh, and, and then, when it came down to it, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus three times. Now, perhaps you have failed spiritually some way, and you feel shame and guilt, and you don't even feel like you can pray. God won't listen to my prayers, you know. Uh, I don't have the courage to, to talk to him. He's, he's not going to forgive me. And you're spiritually discouraged. You might feel that, man, I've messed up so bad with God, he could never use me again. Well, as someone who has messed up in his life, let me tell you, he can He can. You check your ego at the door. You admit your sin and mistakes before the Lord. You confess it sincerely and repent. The Bible tells us that God will forgive us and he can restore us. Now, let's go back to Peter. Jesus had resurrected from the dead. He had appeared to various people. And on one occasion, he had appeared to his his disciples, and they were out fishing. They didn't catch anything. Jesus said, throw your nets in again. They filled up with fish. Another miracle. Jesus said, come on in. Let's have breakfast. And Jesus put some fish and some bread on the hot coals and made his disciples breakfast in his resurrected state. But then there was Peter. Him and Jesus had some unfinished business. Peter had yet to admit his sin and his denials to the Lord. And so the story picks up in the Gospel of John in chapter 21. It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Where did we hear that before? 
Jesus is taking that situation where Peter said, even if all my buddies, even if all the other disciples deny you, Lord, I won't. You can count on me. I'm your number one disciple. I'll be there. If they grab you, I, I will even die with you, Lord. I'm not going to deny you. And he did. And Jesus put it back on him. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And the word Jesus used for love was agape, that committed, unconditional love. And Peter responded, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And the word for love that Peter used was phileo, that brotherly love, where we get the word Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Peter knew that he had denied the Lord. He knew that he had failed Jesus. He knew that he didn't demonstrate that completely committed love. And so he couldn't use the word agape. Jesus knew what was going on. So verse 16, Jesus said to Peter a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. Jesus is saying, listen, I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to tend my sheep. In other words, I want you to lead, Peter. I haven't invested all this time and effort in you. You're the one to lead. You're the one to bring the message of God's love and hope and salvation through me to the Jews and the world. You're the one to lead. Feed my sheep, those that will come as new believers. Peter, you're the one. Verse 17, Jesus said to Peter a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Because Jesus said to him the third time, do you love me? Peter's thinking, I, the Lord doesn't think I'm sincere. Jesus doesn't think I really do love him. I've really messed up. The Lord completely doubts me. I have no character, no standing before Jesus. Man, why is he asking me three times? And so Peter said, Lord, you know everything. I, you know, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, then feed my sheep, care for my sheep, teach my sheep, protect my sheep. He's talking about the church, the early Christians. It's interesting, too, that Jesus referred to Peter as, as Simon, not Peter. Jesus gave Simon the name Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, Jesus said, I will build my church. Why did he call him Simon? Because Peter hadn't been acting like much of a rock lately. He was wishy-washy. He didn't show character. And he failed. Does that remind you of anyone? <laughs> Reminds me of myself. Like Peter, I... I want to be 100% for Jesus, 100%. And in my weakness, in my failings, I mess up. I want to agape Jesus with all my heart, unconditionally, completely committed. But sometimes I mess up. And I have to say like Peter did, Lord, you know that I love you. Yes, I have failed. Forgive me. Please use me. Something else I want you to see. Peter denied that he even knew Jesus three times. And Jesus has Peter affirm his love for him three times. It's important that we see that. As Jesus reestablishes, recommissions, reaffirms his relationship with Peter and Peter's calling to ministry. Listen, don't give up <laughs> if you've messed up. Check your ego at the door. Admit when you're wrong. You can fail forward from spiritual failure, church. 
The Bible tells us in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. That's good news. <laughs> when we come clean with God in humility, sincerely, he, he, he forgives us, and the cool thing about God is once he forgives, he forgets. We have a hard time forgetting but God forgives and forgets, and we move on. Good news. Final way to fail forward is that we learn from our mistakes and we don't give up. We learn from our mistakes. We don't give up. It's easy to fail backwards. And we've probably all known people who have failed backwards. Maybe we ourselves at a time in our lives have failed backwards where we don't learn from our mistakes when we repeat the same mistakes and when we get to a point when we've just given up i've talked to a lot of people who say pastor i had a weakness to alcohol it controlled me uh, and i just i couldn't beat it i couldn't fight it and at one point i just gave up and it ruined my career it ruined my marriage it ruined my family it ruined my life finally Jesus got a hold of my heart and my mind and my behavior, and I was able to change. And he forgave me, and he restored me, and he healed me, and he redeemed me. That's failing forward. And we can do that. <laughs> We've all heard of Michael Jordan, arguably uh, the best basketball player ever he knows about failure and he also knows about not giving up michael jordan once said i have missed more than 9000 shots in my career i've lost almost 300 games 26 times i've been trusted to take the game winning shot and i missed i have failed over and over and over again in my life and that's why I succeed. Guy who learned to fail forward. What about Peter? Peter learned to fail forward after he had that little talk with Jesus. <laughs> he learned his lessons and he accomplished God's purpose for his life. Uh, after Jesus finally ascended to be with the Father in heaven and gave his disciples the great commission, it was Peter who stood up amongst uh, the, the remaining followers of Jesus, which was only 120 people. That's it. But it was Peter that stood up and spoke and led. It was Peter who preached the first sermon on the day of Pentecost when all the people had come into Jerusalem. Peter was the one who told them that this Jesus, whom we knew, who did works in front of us, he was the one. He was our Messiah that we'd waited for seven, eight hundred years. Brothers and sisters, we missed him. And you crucified him. That was Peter who preached the first sermon. And also, Peter wrote, was behind First and Second Peter. Two of the books in our own Bible, which shows the strength of faith and character and leadership that he had. Peter failed forward. Let me read to you what happened on that first day when the church was born in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 to 38. It says this, let all the house of Israel, this is Peter, preaching the first gospel message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, let all the house of Israel, he starts with the Jews, which is what Jesus told them to do, therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. They would have remembered. It had only been a little over a month. Verse 37, now when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart cut to the heart 
they were convicted. That was, Jesus was our Messiah? And we did that to him? They were cut to the heart, the Bible says. And they said to Peter, And the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What they mean is, what shall we do to be saved? And it was Peter who said to them, repent. Change your mind about who you thought he was. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the people heard this message from Peter, and they responded. And it tells us in verse 41, So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Wow! The church started, it says, with 3,000 souls. There's a good chance there was more, because they typically only counted the men back then. Sorry, ladies. But if you consider the ladies... Who responded? Maybe the children. Maybe that first day of the church had ten to 15,000 on that first call to put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, none of us are perfect. We're all flawed. We still carry the stain of a sinful human nature because of our ancestors, Adam and Eve, and yet we don't have to be defined by our failures and our sin and our mistakes. You don't have to be defined by that addiction. You don't have to be defined by that divorce. You don't have to be defined from that thievery, that immorality. That's not who you are. You can bring all that to the foot of the cross. That's why Jesus came in the first place. Confess it, repent of it. It's forgiven and it's forgotten. And that's the best news, church. And that's how we fail forward.